Hi, everyone. And thanks to uh, Philip, Alina, and uh, Michael for organizing this nice uh, online seminar. Uh, feel free to interrupt with any questions. Uh, this is, I should be, I, I should be able to finish within the, a lot of time, no worries. Uh, so I'd like to tell you today about uh, efficient quantum factoring algorithms. So let's, let me, uh, I'm not sure if it's needed in this, uh, for this audience, but let me remind you what factoring integers is all about. Uh, and you know, if you have a number like 15, what you want to know is it's three times five and, and you knew that 21 is three times seven. Uh, 55 is five times 11, but as numbers become bigger, it's a bit more challenging already for 1843, you know, maybe some of you can guess or, or can figure it out and, you know, it would take a few seconds, but it's already a bit more challenging, right? So 1843 is, I'll give you a second, but it's, it's 97 times 90. What about 8051? Okay, that's that's even trickier. And there's actually a nice story about 8051. Let me show you the, the story. So uh, Carl Pormerans shared this uh, story, this experience he had from a high school math contest. So they asked him to factor uh, 8051. And well, he was fairly good at arithmetic, right? And he was he was sure he could easily try to divide it uh, up to you need to try to divide up to about ninety. So he thought, okay, what's the big deal? But you know he wants to be clever, so let's try to figure out how to do it more cleverly without just trying to divide up to ninety. Uh, and he spent a couple of minutes looking for the clever way to do it, but then started getting worried that he's uh, wasting too much time. Uh, he did waste too much time, and he he missed the problem. So this uh, fun story was probably quite uh, traumatic for him. Uh, later, he figured out how to do it. And the trick is this, uh, you write 8051 as 8100 uh, minus 49. And 8100 is the square of 90, 49 is the square of seven. So you have 90 square minus seven square. And that's just 90 minus seven times 90 plus seven. So it's 83 times 97. Um, that actually, uh, that trick is actually what later led him to develop very fast factoring algorithms like the quadratic sieve and, and, and other algorithms, including the one we'll talk about today and Shor's algorithm. I mean, they use a similar idea. What's basically happening here is we're, we're finding a non-trivial square root of identity modulo 8051 in, in some sense. So you'll see it later coming up, this number 8051, we'll get back to it. So this is actually from a highly uh, recommended and a prize uh, award-winning award -winning article that he wrote, wrote in the notices of the AMS. So highly recommend reading that. This is from Carl Pomerantz. Okay, moving on, factoring is a hard problem. Uh, computers uh, have trouble doing this, factoring numbers. The current record is uh, 250 decimal digits. I think it's 800 something binary digits. It took 2,700 computer years. Okay, this is um, a group who did this a few years ago. Uh, you know, lots of computation power and that's currently the world record for factoring difficult numbers. Like the like number here, it's an RSA number. It's a product of two big primes. Okay, so it's exceedingly difficult, uh, at least, um, you know, it seems so, it's not an NP hard problem, right? So it seems like it's a hard problem. The best known algorithm, the number field if it's, you know, it's a beautiful algorithm. It runs in time that exponential in the cube root of number of digits. So it's, you know, it's, it's highly non-trivial. The fact that something like that exists is amazing, uh, but it's still, you know, it's still exponential in, 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 in N to the one third. And so it's, you know, at some point, you know, it's still, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a wall and that sets around these this numbers of 250 digits. Um, and this is extremely important problem, right? We, you know, we use it for any form of secure communication, you know, any form of encryption or signatures, you know, those things are critically, you know, rely on things like that, on, on factoring, uh, on the fact that it's hard to factorize integers. So, 
it was a big shock, a big surprise when in 1994, uh, Peter Shore was shown here, found that factoring is actually easy. It's easy for quantum computers. Okay, so he saw, he found the algorithm, the quantum algorithm that can very quickly, very easily factorize integers. Um, and this was a big shock because it's saying, you know, all the security, everything we do, everything we use to encrypt, you know, to send emails, to connect to our bank, everything can be broken, um, you know, the minute we have quantum computers. That was a big shock. Um, and, you know, is it really the, the end of the world uh, because of Shor's algorithm? And well, not so fast, right? So luckily starting last summer, you know, there's a transition happening where people and, and uh, networks and, and browsers and, and websites transition to post-quantum cryptography. So that post-quantum means uh, cryptography that's secure against quantum computers. So it's not based at all on, on things like factoring integers, it's based on things like um, geometry of, uh, of lattices in high dimension typically. Okay, so that's something that's already started. There is another reason why maybe you're not terribly worried is that maybe quantum computers do not exist yet. Okay, so those things are don't exist, at least big enough computers don't exist, but there's constant progress. So this was early on, 2017. You know, this was IBM had some you know machine like that, and a few years later, another one uh, from Google. And another one, and, and basically nowadays it seems like every week there's a bigger and better quantum computer. Um, whether they'll be big enough to actually factor as numbers, I don't know. I can show you some uh, nice um, you know, uh, figure that I took from Sam Jack. And, and so what's, what I, I actually don't know what's going on in this figure. It, it, it almost sounds uh, very interesting, but don't ask me too many questions about the details here. But basically what he's showing is, this is kind of where computers are. Nowadays, actually, I think there's been some progress. So maybe it's somewhere here and here, there are a few other points. And this is kind of where you need to be to factorize numbers, to use Shor's algorithm. And there's some other milestones along the way, like surface codes, and I, I don't know much about this, but basically that's kind of where you hear, you have maybe hundred qubits, maybe a few hundred qubits now, and for to break up to factor as numbers like RSA, you need probably tens or hundreds of millions of, of qubits really to, to factorize them well, because these are really physical qubits and it's, it's difficult. Okay, so what is the purpose of today's talk? It's not about how to build a quantum computer. I really want to show you this. Maybe, maybe there is a way to improve Shaw's algorithm and, and be able to factorize you know, with you know, um, worse quantum computers in some way. Maybe we can somehow optimize the algorithm and, and factorize in an easier way. That's the goal. Let's see how we get there. Uh, again, feel free to interrupt if there are any questions. So let's, let's read this carefully. Okay, so this is the main result. There is an algorithm and it relies on some mild number theoretic assumption, even though this is a seminar about number theory. I will not go into details of what exactly the assumption is. I can say, if you want, I can say something about this. But there is some mild number theoretic assumption. You'll see where it's coming up later. Under that assumption, there's an algorithm for factoring n-bit integers, and it uses only something like n to the three halves gates. So it's a quantum circuit with only n to the 1.5 or three halves gates. It needs to apply this quantum circuit multiple times. It needs to apply it n to the one half, so square root of n times roughly, independently. And then it takes all, all the outputs from those quantum circuits and performs some polynomial time, classical post-processing. That's very easy. And then gives you the factorization. So for comparison, if you look at Shor's algorithm, it's, it requires a bigger circuit. It requires a circuit with n squared gates. So if you look at this, you, you're kind of wondering, what did we actually gain? I mean, this is n squared, and this is n three halves times n to the one half, so it's the same thing. Well, the thing is that quantum computers are very fragile, and it could be that you might have a quantum computer that can run for that many gates, 
into the three halves, and then basically decoheres, you know, and basically breaks. So if you have something like that, you can just run that computer just multiple times. You know, once you can do it, you can run it once, you can just run it multiple times. That's not an issue typically, right? It doesn't really you know, burn or, something, or go, goes up in flames and self-destruct, right? You can just run the computer again multiple times. That's not an issue. The important thing is you don't have to, com don't have to keep the calculation coherent for too long. That's really the idea here. I, can, I only need to do n to the three halves gates and not n squared gates. Okay, that's really the idea. The fact I have to do it multiple times is not a big deal. In principle, and in theory, we can talk about the practice in a minute, but at least in theory, that's the idea. So that, you know, in principle, all else being equal, fewer gates should be easier to implement. Okay, so again, this is, this is a good time for questions, just like any other time during this talk. Let me know if anything is, is not clear. There are many things I'm hiding, so it's, it's, it's good to ask some questions. Let me say also, this was extended to discrete logarithms. I'll, I'll be talking about factorization, but um, you can also extend it and you can see this recent uh, uh, preprint from Ekara and Gartner. Okay, also another maybe footnote here, those estimates assume that you're using fast integer multiplication. In practice, you, you, know, you probably don't want to use those fast integer multiplication because they incur a big constant. There's a big overhead usually for small numbers. But the, the similar speed up is, is there, no matter what multiplication algorithm you use. Okay, so, so that's kind of the, the statement. Before moving on to talk about how it's done, let me maybe talk about uh, the practice. You know, what, is, what does it actually mean? You know, does it mean we can factor as numbers you know, using existing computers, existing quantum computers? Well, no, the answer is not yet. It's actually not even clear if this algorithm improves in practice on Shor's algorithm. When I say in practice, I mean for small numbers, like numbers that we care about in practice, like 2000 bits. You know, If I want to really factorize numbers that are used currently in, in cryptography, like 2000 bit numbers, the thing about Shor's algorithm is that it's really amenable to many, many optimizations. You know, it's, if you look at its actual implementation, the constants are very good because it's relatively, um, Compared, compared to what I'll show you today, it's, it's simpler. The constants are better. So those, you know, all those constants, they, they really matter once you want to factor as a number with only 2,000 bits. You know, once you go to bigger numbers, um, then the advantages, the asymptotic advantages that I'll show you today, they can uh, kick in. But you know, for, for small numbers like 2,000 bits, you might not still see the improvement. Um, so again, Shor is generally highly optimized uh, and it's, it's hard to beat it, especially it's hard to beat it for small numbers, like 2000 bits. And I should also say generally, just the question is, you know, what is better in practice? It's a difficult question because what is practice? There are currently many different architectures of quantum computers out there. You know, people build super, you know, some superconducting qubits. Others use neutral atoms. This is a new, uh, you know, new progress from Harvard and, and a company called QR. There is, you know, there are, there are people using, you know, optics. You know, people. Um, uh, so there are multiple different implementations, uh, and each one has its own limitations. Some, you know, can implement uh, certain gates. Some have difficulty implementing some other gates. Some have issue with uh, with space, with number of qubits. So. Basically, there are many trade-offs, and the trade-offs are very different depending on the architecture you have in mind. So answering, there's no very easy answer to this question of whether this algorithm is useful in practice, because practice is not yet there. We don't know what is the quantum computer that will be there in a year. Um, having said that, there, there are some you know, clear, uh, one clear issue that, that I should point out with this algorithm uh, is the amount of uh, space or number of qubits that it needs. That's a, it's a big topic, it's a big issue because at least for superconducting qubits for some architectures, um, like the one Google uses for instance, the number of qubits is a big bottleneck. So it's, you know, it's very difficult for them to add more qubits. And the advantage of Shor, even though Shor needs more gates, even though Shor you know, does many more gates, 
it's actually quite amazing. You can implement Shor with very few qubits. So the, the, the amount of quantum memory you need is very, it's, it's only three times 10 logical qubits. And at least what I show you today needs in principle many more. It needs n to the three half qubits. Um, you might see why, you know, if, if you want to know, I, I can tell you, ask me later why. But luckily, this was recently improved to about 15n. This is work by Raghavan and Vaikuntanathan. So it's not quite as optimized as sure in terms of memory, but I think it's kind of, we're getting there. And I should also say that some of the implement, some of the architectures that people use, like the one I mentioned from the group of uh, Lukin and this company called Qera, might not be as sensitive as other architectures and might, you know, it might be easier for them to just get more qubits. It's not really the main bottleneck uh, potentially for them. So in short, this is a difficult question and I'm you know, not an expert in uh, quantum architectures, of physical uh, architectures of quantum computers. I just want to show you some of the pros and cons. There's clearly an advantage I'll show you today, an asymptotic advantage in terms of number of gates, but you know, there are pros and cons everywhere. So I mean, I'm, I'm running very fast. So any questions? I see some things in the chat. I don't know if it's for me. I can try to look into that. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's not for me, probably. Anything else? Any questions? Should I move on? Okay. So we want to see how the theorem is proven, but for that, I first have to tell you about Shor's algorithm. So this is Shor's algorithm. If you haven't seen it, it's okay. I, I won't assume you, you know anything about it because it's actually all here in this slide. So Shor's algorithm is all about finding the periodicity of a function, and the function is this exponentiation function. So Shor takes this function that maps z to four to the power z, okay? Um, it doesn't have to be four, but let's take four, for example, and you take it modulo 8051. This function, this exponentiation function, or this, I should say, modular exponentiation function has a period. And if you look at this, you might be able to see there are lots of colors. So what I do here, I kind of use color to represent the value four to the power z. So you know, this is initially, it's, it's uh, four to the power zero. So it's one, four, 16, you know, 64. And then, you know, it goes on and on and on and on. At some point, you know, you start, uh, you start seeing there is this periodicity, there's a cycle, and maybe you can already spot that. If you look carefully, you will see that kind of around this region, we start seeing the same thing we have here. So this is, this is the point, it's actually 984 where the function starts repeating itself. So there's a period happening here. And I can show you that um, with this nice animation. So look carefully and I'm going to move this here and place it on top of the original one. And I think you can see that it's, it's identical. Okay, so this is, this is where the period happens in this function. So around this region here, let me show you again, you start, um, you start having a period. Now, once you have this period of 1984, once you have this period of 984, you're basically done. I'll show you in the next slide how you exactly do that. Let me just say one more thing that Shor's algorithm actually uh, needs to do more than computing this function. So what Shor's algorithm, uh, what it does is computing this function actually in superposition. So you have to do it inside the quantum computer. That's important and you do it in superposition over all the possible inputs up to some bound, okay? So together kind of simultaneously in superposition, you compute all those values of four to the power Z modulo 8051, and then you use the big hammer called QFT, quantum Fourier transform. That's, that's you know, the, the main idea in this algorithm and in pretty much any other quantum algorithm um, that gives you exponential speed ups. Quantum Fourier transform is very good at identifying periods, and it's, it allows you to, to identify that 984 is the period of this function. Okay. Once you know that, once you know the period of this function, it's 984, then you're done. And this is really very basic uh, number theory. So I'll, 
I'll go ahead and show you this, but you know, uh, it's probably uh, well known uh, to many of you. Um, having figured out that the period of four is non 84, okay, so once we know what the period is of, of, of this number four, of this uh, modular exponentiation, what it means is that four to the 984, right, it's like four to the zero, it's like one, okay? What it means is that if I take not four, if I take two, if I take two to the power 984, that number is a square root of one, right? Because if I square this number, I get four to the 984, and that's one. So that's why I chose four, because four is a square, so it was convenient to work with the square number. So once I know the period of four, I know that I have a power of two, namely two to the 984. And in this case, it's, you know, it's 1163, and that is square root of one. Okay, so, you know, going back to Pomeranz, uh, you see that having a square root of one is very nice. Now, it's not a trivial square root of one. It's not like one or minus one, right? It's 1163. So once I know I have this period, I'm basically done because I have the square root of one. And once I have the square root of one, I know that 1163 minus one times 1163 plus one, you just expand it, you get 1163 squared minus one, that is zero, right? Because because it's a square root, because 1163 is square root uh, modulo 8051. And what does that mean? That means that 8051 divides 1163 minus one times 1163 plus one, which means that 8051 must have a non-trivial uh, common factor with one of them, so I can easily extract it by running GCD. And that's really the end of Shaw's algorithm. I use GCD to compute um, the common factor of 8051, and one of these, maybe this one, 1162, that gives me 83, and I'm done because 8051 is 83 times 97. So, again, the idea is to find the um, the period of this function, or I should say maybe it's the, kind of the, um, the, the order, the multiplicative order of four, modulo 8051. And from that, I can easily factorize 8051. Okay. So that's kind of very briefly, this is Shaw's algorithm. And again, the idea is you know, to look at a function like this, like four to the power Z, and figure out at some point it has a period. Okay, around the, this, in this case, around 984. Okay, so what's the issue? You know, we're very happy with Shaw's algorithm, but as I was saying, it, it requires many gates. So let's try to understand how many gates it actually requires. And, and luckily, the, the, the number of gates is really just dominated by this classical part of computing exponentiation. Everything else, like initializing the circuit or doing the quantum Fourier transform, it's actually very fast. Okay, so it turns out this is really the only thing you have to worry about it's a classical computation. Given the number z, you want to compute a to the power z, okay? You have to compute it inside the quantum computer in superposition. That's why we, it's, it's so expensive, right? You know, it, on my laptop, on my phone, you know, I can easily do that. But quantum computers don't have those you know, billions of uh, memory cells yet, like our phones have. So how do we do that? Well, this is, this is well known. We use a trick. Um, um, to compute this thing. And, and we have to compute, I should say, we have to compute this function for a relatively large z because we need to be able to get to see the period and the period can be actually quite far. So remember, 8051 is an example, but typically the number is going to be, the modulus is going to have maybe 2000 bits. And you probably have to go really far until you see the period. You would have to go something like two to the power little n, little n being like 2000. That's the number of bits you have in the number you want to factorize. So Z is pretty big. It can go up to 2000 bit number in order to make sure you see the period, right? The multiplicative order can be quite big. But once you're, you know, at this point, you'll surely see the period already. So, you know, that's kind of how high you have to go with this exponent, two to the little n. How do you do that? Well, of course, you don't do just A times A times A times A. This, this will never uh, finish. What you do is use repeated squaring, right? So this is a this is a standard trick that you use to very quickly compute that exponent. Well, we'll try to improve with it today. I'll try to show you how to improve on this, but 
the trick, the way it works in Scholl's algorithm at least, is that you basically do repeat the squaring. So you do a, a squared, a to the power four, a to the power eight by squaring repeatedly. And if you just calculate, and I'll show you the next slide, it takes n multiplications that you have to do. Basically, each time you square, you have to do one multiplication. And each multiplication involves n bit numbers. And assuming we can multiply n bit numbers in roughly n time, so this is, this is a fast integer multiplication algorithm. So we know that we can do it in time roughly n or n log n. In total, we get n squared gates in the quantum circuit. So this is, this is where the n squared comes from in Shor's algorithm, because you have to, again, do n multiplications, and each multiplication involves multiplying n bit numbers. So in total, we have n squared gates. If you don't use integer, fast integer multiplication, if you use naive multiplication, you know, school book, uh, it will be n cubed. Okay, but but let's for, it doesn't matter. You can do it either way. But for let's let's be uh, for simplicity. Let's focus on this and, and talk about n squared gates here. Let me show you exactly how repeated squaring works, just to make sure we are on the same page. So if I want to compute a to the power say twenty nine, okay, what I do is this: I start with a square, I get a squared. I multiply by a, I get a cubed. I square it, I get a to the six. I multiply by a, I get a to the seven. I square, I get a to the 14. I square again, I get a to the 28. And I multiply by a, I get a to the 29. How did I decide on when to multiply, when to square? This is based on the binary uh, representation of 29. Basically, you know, each time I had to add, uh, you know, if you think of the exponents, either I add one to the exponent or multiply by two. So it's essentially the binary decomposition of 29. Okay, so this is it for uh, Shor's algorithm. And I told you it's n squared gates, uh, right? And the key, uh, the, the slowest step is, is having to compute this exponentiation. So before moving on here, an idea, here's a very naive idea. Shor's algorithm takes this a to be a random number. I didn't say that, but I should say, it. takes it to be a random number. Let's try to be clever. Maybe let's use a small number. Let's take A to be a small number, maybe four. I gave you an example before. Let's use number four. Number four is small. So intuitively, maybe it's easier to work with four because you know it's easier to multiply by four, right? If I want to multiply by four, it's very fast. Um, turns out this doesn't help at all because if you think about what's going on here, you're doing those n steps and those numbers very quickly are going to become big n bit numbers. There's really not, not much you can do. Just even just multiplying them by four requires n operations because those are n-bit numbers. And of course, something like squaring the number takes n operations, n gates, because this is this n-bit number that you're trying to square. If you start with a small number, sure, it buys you a little bit in the beginning because this is four, which is a very small number. And no, this is 16 because you square it. But very quickly, those numbers become basically like kind of generic n-bit numbers. You know, modulo your, your composite. So you actually don't gain anything, almost anything, by using a small number. Because very quickly, those numbers become huge. Like they become n bit numbers, basically. So we don't really benefit much. But you'll see later, it will be really one of the main ideas is, is to use a small number. But we need another idea to make it work. OK. So that doesn't help us much. Let's see how we actually introduce another idea and maybe it will help. Okay, that's the idea. So what's going on here? That's a two dimensional picture now. Okay, so previously we had like one dimensional, everything was in one dimension. Now I want to do two dimensions. So I choose two numbers, so choose four and nine. No, just four. Previously I had four and had all the exponents of four. Now I took two kind of two bases of the exponent, and I have a different function. It's a, it's a kind of two-dimensional function. It takes two numbers, z1, z2, and computes four to the power z1 times nine to the power z2. Why? Okay, it's not clear. 
uh, or maybe uh, let me already spoil and, and tell you this will turn out to be easier, faster to compute for, for some reason you'll see in a minute. But bear with me, let's just see why, why it even makes sense. So what I'm showing you here is a similar kind of plot. Basically each kind of pixel here is the value four to the power Z1 times nine to the power Z2, right? For some value here, the Z1 is I think on the Y axis and Z2 is on the X axis, okay? And um, this function, as you can probably appreciate, this function also has a period, right? So kind of here, this, this point here is basically corresponds to one because it's four to the power zero times nine to the power zero, this is one. And I think, um, so you, you can see my mouse cursor, right? I hope it's visible. Okay, and this is like this, this point here would be like here, it's four and 16 and here's nine and 81 and so on. And this function also has a period and you can kind of see it here. It actually has many periods. It has this period here, here and here. Um, so it's a kind of two dimensional, it's a two dimensional periodicity. It's not one dimensional like before. So there are multiple periods, but that's okay. It's still a period. And let me show you again, the same animation. Let's see what it looks like here. So look carefully. And I hope you see the animation smoothly enough. I'm kind of shifting it, this, this, and you kind of see now how nicely this aligns with, its, with itself, right? So this point here is a period, and I think it's like 47 comma something comma, we'll see in the next slide. So there's a period here, and let's see what, what this tells us and how we use it to factorize numbers. Okay, so again, all I did now, it just, did the same thing that Chor does, but in two dimensions. Eventually, we'll have to go to higher dimension. It's not going to be two dimensional, but for this nice picture, I prefer to do it in two dimensions so we can actually see what's going on. Okay, so this is exactly like before. Once you figure out the period, once you know the period is 19,47, you're done. And let me show you why. It's basically the same reasoning as before. Let's just see it again to make sure everything is fine. So once you know the period is 19 comma 47, so what does it mean? It means that four to the power 19 times nine to the power 47 is the same as the origin, is the same as four to the zero times nine to the zero. In other words, it's one. So we found that this number here is one modulo 8051. But that immediately gives me a square root of one. It immediately, it immediately gives me the two to the power 19 times three to the power 47 is a non-trivial square root of one. Gives me this number 6888. This number, if you square it, you know, obviously you get this number here, the 419 uh, times nine to the 47, which is one. So this number here, 6888, if you square it, it should be one modulo 8051, okay? And once you have a square root of one, you're done just like before, because 8051 divides 6888 minus one times 6888 plus one, right? Because if I expand this, I get 6888 squared minus one, right? Which is divisible by 8051. And then I can recover a factor using GCD. I take a GCD of 6887 and 8051, I get 97 and we're done, right? 8051 is 83 times 97 and we're done. All checks out? Okay, so we, basically the exact same idea as before. So all I told you so far is that, sure, you can take Scholl's algorithm, you can do it in two dimensions, and you, know, you can still factor as numbers, but it's not clear if you actually gain anything. If anything, it looks more complicated, right? What's the advantage of going to two dimensions? So let's try to understand number of gates and try to understand if we actually gained anything. And what we have to compute is this. So in general, it's not in two dimensions, it's in D dimensions. And D will be something like square root of N, you'll see later why, D will be square root of number of bits. Okay, so if I have a thousand bit number to factorize, right? So this would be around, I don't know, 30 something. D is the dimension, it would be like square root of n. And what I want to compute is this. I want to take a couple of, of integers, z1, z2 up to zd, and I want to compute this product of a1 to the z1, a2 to the z2. And those ais are going to be some small squares, like 4, 9, 25, okay? 
the main idea is this the main the hope of the hope where we're hoping to gain is that because you're in dimension d you don't have to go so far to see the period you don't have to raise those numbers ai to such a high period and you can kind of see it here if i go back to this animation we had the period was not so far from the origin, right? You only have to go a little bit here or here to see the period. I don't have to go to you know, like, you know, six, you know, some, some 8,000 uh, far in, into, this, into this function. It's relatively close to the, in terms of some kind of uh, some distance, uh, it's relatively close to the origin. And, and that's to be expected because, you know, I have, I have two dimensions, so I kind of explore much more in the same volume. Like there are many more points I explore here, in the same volume. So it's to be expected I'll find a period um, closer to the origin in terms of distance from the origin. Okay. So basically, and you can see this by basically by some kind of pigeonhole, right? If you think of how many different uh, exponents or how many different such inputs I explore, if I go all the way up to 2 to the n over d, well, each of them can go up to 2 to the n over d, and I have d of them, right? So in total, I explore two to the n different possible inputs. So by pigeonhole, there must be a collision. At some point I will start seeing a period, right? There must be a collision with powers up to two to the n over d. Okay, so previously it was two to the n, now it's two to the n over d, which sounds like it might help us because it means we don't have to exponentiate so much. We don't have to raise things to some you know, very high power like two to the n, we only have to raise to power two to the n over d. Okay, maybe it's an advantage. Actually, you know, once you write things down, each exponentiation now requires less. That's true because you only have to do n over d multiplications, right? We're doing this repeated squaring trick, so I, I know a square, a square again. So to get to those powers, to this two to the n over d, I only have to multiply n over d times which is cool, right? It's great, but I have to do it d times. So it seems like we really didn't gain anything. Okay, this sounds, this seems totally stupid. What I told you now is that's like, ex, you know, extend to d dimensions. Sounds like a great idea. We don't have to raise things to such high power. You know, all sounds great, but actually when you do the, you know, you actually work out the calculation, I don't, you know, it's not obvious if we gain anything because I still have to raise to this power. So I have to do N over D multiplications, <clears throat> but I have to do it D times. So it's something like N in total and I didn't get anything. Previously, it was the same thing. We had to do N multiplications in Schwarz algorithm. Each one involves like N bit numbers. So it involves like something like N gates. In total, we still have N squared gates. Too bad. Okay, so what's the idea? We need just one more ingredient, and that's oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry question, there, question. Can I ask a question Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yes. about the previous slide? Um, okay. So yes. yeah, so in this process, um, so eight zero five one divides the product of two numbers. If one of them ended up being prime, then it wouldn't have worked, right? Like you find the GCD, it would be one. Oh. So I think. Yeah, so, so I mean, it has to be, the eight, 851 has to divide this number just by arithmetic. We know yeah. it divides it. Mm -hmm. I think with the concern you're alluding to, and this, uh, I was trying to hide it, so it's a great, great that you brought it up. It's an occasion for me to mention it. The concern here is, is that it could happen that this number here, 2 to the 19 times 3 to the 47, it could happen that this is a trivial square root of 1. Okay, this is something that, that could happen. It could happen that this number is really like, modulo 851. It's really just one. Okay. Mm -hmm. In which case, uh, what you'll have here is not interesting. In other words, maybe this first number will divide 851, and the other one would be whatever prime or whatever you want. It's nothing to do with mm -hmm. 851. So this is really the concern. The concern is that this is the only thing I did not really justify. And, and actually. If you go back to this picture, you might see, maybe you, you were wondering why I took this period and not the one here when I did this animation, mm -hmm. why I decided to take this one here at this position, 47, 19, and not the one here. And that's exactly because the one here happens to correspond 
to a trivial square root of one. If you actually calculate whatever this one is, I know it's like 15 or, this will happen to be um, just one, a modulo A to 51. Mm -hmm. So there's a real issue here, and maybe I'll get back to it at the end. And this is this number theoretic heuristic that I mentioned in the beginning. So there's a heuristic here saying that those numbers can behave randomly enough, those, those exponents that I expect to find a period that's both uh, short, both close, like this, close to the origin, like here, and non-trivial. So there are trivial periods that don't help me factor as a number. Mm -hmm. And the heuristic says that you know, it's, it, it behaves randomly enough that this will uh, not happen typically, okay? So I, I can talk more about this. It, there's a, there's yeah, a, thank you. Yeah, that, yeah, so it's a great, great point. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, thanks. Thank you, Akash. Great, so this is, yeah, it's great that uh, this came up. Um, uh, and and I, I might maybe get back to it at the end. Um, and and yeah, okay. So going on, okay, so let me just complete basically the algorithm. And the only missing idea is that there's actually a way to make this calculation faster. And I should say, this is really kind of classical. In this point, it's really just about classical computation. There's, there's nothing quantum here, of course. Just how to compute this product more efficiently. And it turns out you can do it, but you need something to assume. You need to assume that the ARs are small. So this is the point where it's actually very useful to assume that the ARs are small. For Shaw's algorithm, we didn't gain much, but here it's really crucial. So let's choose the ARs to be small. Let's take them to be 4, 9, 25, 49, just, just maybe squares of the smallest primes. Okay, those are very small numbers. They will not have like, you know, end bits there. They have some log end bits. They're very, very small numbers. And turns out, once the ARs are so small, we can compute this, this product here. We can compute it using only n over d multiplications. Okay, not n like we had before. It's only n over d. So we really gain something. I should actually be more precise. It's n over d big number multiplications. You also have to multiply small numbers like four times nine or nine times 25, but that's very easy. That, that doesn't require many gates. To multiply four times nine, I, even I can do in a piece of paper, right? The issue is multiplying big numbers, like n bit numbers, that takes time. And that you only need to do, luckily, n over d times. So this is really how to do this. It's kind of boring, but it's really crucial, right? So let me show you how this is done. You can give it as an exercise, you know, in, in the computer science algorithms course. But let me show you how it's done. It's, you know, you have to, you have to think of it. It's not uh, obvious, but it's also not uh, very sophisticated anyway. So let me show you how it's done. But let me just say, once you do that, you only have n over d multiplication. So number of gates just went down from n squared to n squared over d, which is great. You know, we have an advantage. And I told you I'd choose d to be square root. So it kind of all works out fine. I have n to the three halves gates, as I promised in the new algorithm. Okay. You might have some questions now. Uh, and if so, let me know. Questions? <laughs> okay. So let me just show you how it's done. It's really just a kind of basic um, arithmetic. So first, let's just talk about something simpler. If I just want to, want to, I want to multiply numbers, so I have some d small numbers to multiply. So I want to multiply you know, a1 times a2 times a3 up to a8, a8. How do I do that? This is not a good way to do it. This is not a good way to multiply because if you do it this way, like a1 times a2 times a3 times a4 times a5, this is not good because very quickly numbers become bigger. They become like d bits because you have d numbers, so they become d bit numbers. And then each time you have to multiply, you have to spend another d gates just to multiply by the next number. This will end up like being like this squared. So you really want to do like a binary tree. You want to first multiply the small numbers together. So A1, A2, and then A3, A4, and then multiply the result together. Turns out, as maybe you, you would expect, it's actually much more efficient doing this way because most of the multiplications are done with very small numbers because the A's are very small. And I just have to do at the end, at the, at the, uh, the root of the tree, the, at the top of the tree, I have to do the big multiplication, but very few of them. So, you know, if you just do the math, it's something like d gates or d log d or something like that. So, this is 
how to multiply numbers and now how do they go to exponentiation? It's a similar idea you want to combine with the repeated squaring. Basically, you know, even if you don't follow the details, the crucial thing is that you always want to multiply small numbers. Whenever possible, you want to multiply small numbers and minimize as much as possible having to multiply big numbers. So here is how it's done. Imagine I want to compute this thing here, like a1 to the 13, a2 to the 9th, a3 cube, a4 to the 6th. I start with just number one, you know, so all the numbers are to the power zero. And I first multiply by a1, a2. Okay. And again, computing a1, a2 is very simple. Those are small numbers. This, this doesn't take, only takes like, you know, B time to compute. It's very easy to compute those products. So I multi multiply by a1, a2, I get a1, a2. I square, I get a1 squared, a2 squared. Now I multiply by a1, a4, I get a1 cube, a2 squared, and a4. I square this, I get a1 to the 6, a2 to the 4, a3, no, no, no a3 yet, a4 to the uh, 2, or a4 squared. Multiply by a3, a4, I get this, I square, I get this, and one more multiplication, I get what I wanted. So it's really the same trick, same repeated squaring trick. The idea is that kind of the, you want to do the least significant bits, you want to introduce them uh, using this multiplications of the AIs, which you compute as I showed you before using this binary tree. So, you know, if you didn't follow all the details, I'm sure you can, you can complete it offline. The trick again is you want to use small AIs, you want to minimize the multiplications of big, of big numbers. You only multiply the small numbers and then just introduce that into this uh, uh, cumulant, uh, cumulative uh, uh, register and each time square it. So, you know, trust me, this works. This gives you a faster way to multiply, but there is one important missing detail, which maybe you already noticed because I said something very strange. I said, you only need N squared over D gates with this, all this trick of, of you know, optimizing multiplications. But then why not take D to B N? Like, why was I, I mean, clearly the way to optimize this is to take D to B N and not square it N, right? If this is really asymptotic, I should really take D as big as possible, right? So there's an important detail I did not tell you about, and this is this one here, okay? I told you that in Shaw's algorithm, there is a way to do the quantum Fourier transform and you get the period at the end, okay? And you're very happy. The same thing is here, but it's a bit trickier because you're dealing with a D-dimensional object and the periodicity itself is D-dimensional. And to extract the periodicity from the results of the quantum computer, you need to work a bit and you have to use an algorithm created by those three people here. You have to use the lattice reduction algorithm. So this is uh, Lenstra, Lenstra and Lovas. And you have to use an algorithm that can solve D-dimensional lattice problems, okay? Again, Shor didn't have to worry about this. Actually, sure, if you look at the algorithm, there's also some kind of lattice algorithm there. It's, it's basically continuum fractions, if you've seen the algorithm. Uh, this is basically a you know, lattice problem in, in one dimension, some kind of continued fractions he has to do. Same thing here, but we're in D dimensions. So that's why we need to run the quantum circuit multiple times, specifically D times, because that gives us the basis of this lattice. And once we have this basis, we can use lattice reduction to extract the period from that, um, from that basis. So I, I will not show the details of this. This requires some, you know, some calculation with, with lattice reduction, but trust me that this works. The, the issue with this, of course, is that lattice reduction generally is difficult. Luckily here, we can actually do it efficiently using the LLN algorithm. Okay, so it's an efficient polynomial time algorithm. However, the algorithm gives you an approximation factor of two to the D. It's not exact. We're not solving lattice problems exactly here. And this two to the D hurts us because it means that we'll have to explore more exponents because we don't actually find the shortest possible period. We don't solve lattice problem exactly. We solve it with some approximation of two to the D as a result of which the exponents have to go more than what I told you before. So I told you before that by pigeonhole, there is a period only up to two to the n over d. But actually, because I only approximate the lattice problem, I have to go a bit further, uh, further up to two to the n over d plus d. Again, this d coming from 
the two to the d approximation factor of LLL. And the optimal choice, once you look at this, you can see the optimal choice is d being square root of n, and that gives you two to the uh, square root n exponents, which means that you have to uh, use n to the three halves gates, because once the exponents are two to the square root n, I have to do square root n kind of uh, uh, multiplications of n bit numbers. So in total, I have to spend n to the three halves uh, gates in this new algorithm. Okay, so it was a bit fast. I hope you can at least see that there's some trade-off with the performance of LLL, and that you know that's how, that's how the n to the three halves really comes about. Okay, this this kind of trade-off. So I'm slowly running out of time. Let me summarize. Here is the algorithm. We start with small numbers, a1 up to ad. Okay, those are the squares of the first uh, primes, for instance. It could be other something else, but we want them to be small numbers. Okay. I should say the fact that we work with small integers, that's why we need the heuristic. If I chose them to be random numbers, you don't need heuristic. You can say you can, there's enough randomness that you can say that whatever period you find is you know, likely to be non-trivial. Um, and the fact that we work with small numbers requires some kind of heuristic because I don't know really how the small numbers behave multiplicatively modulo composite. Uh, as far as I know, even using something like GRH uh, will not really help us here. Um, so we choose those numbers to be small, whatever way you want. You apply the following quantum circuit d times. The circuit simply computes this, this kind of multi-exponent, computes it in superposition of all those possible exponents, you know, together in a superposition. You apply Q of t, you measure, you get an approximate dual lattice vector. That's really what you get from the Q of t. You get some lattice vector in the dual. You use LLL to recover the period. And that once you have the period, as I showed you before, you can factor as n. That's, that's the end of the algorithm. So I assume you have many questions. I want to leave some time for questions. Just to summarize with some open questions, um, many open questions. Um, reduce the memory, the space, you know, number of qubits we need. Currently, it's about 15n. It would be great to have even fewer. Um, do an actual calculation of actual number of gates, number of physical qubits. This is very, you know, requires understanding the architecture. There's some work now coming also from uh, Ikera and Gartner. They're trying to analyze it a bit better. And it's interesting to see what comes out of this. Um, one thing I did not mention, maybe, um, you, you know, one thing you can try is to improve the lattice algorithm and not use LLL. And that would be interesting to understand this trade-off. And maybe I use fancier classical lattice reduction algorithms, not LLL, and maybe allow, allow ourselves to use uh, smaller quantum computers. So there's a trade-off, interesting trade-off going on here. Um, there's something more technical. Maybe I, I won't mention this. Um, one interesting thing that, that comes up is that, you know, you're running the quantum circuit multiple times, square root n times. The way I presented this, it seems like it has to always work. All square root n have to work, but you might think that some of them will just fail because quantum computers, they're not very reliable. So some of those square root n might fail. Turns out there's a way to deal with those uh, failures. There's a way to make the post-processing more uh, robust. So it can deal once in a while with a failed outcome, with a, with a failed output. And of course, there's number theoretic assumption, which I can say more about. Okay, so I'll stop there and I'll take questions. Thank you.